Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you probably know, we're studying the Sabbath School lessons. We hope you do too, as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the first three months of 2014. And this particular series is entitled Discipleship. And this particular lesson is lesson number eight in that series, entitled With the Rich and Famous. It's the lesson for February 22 of 2014. I hope you have your Bible handy. We always do use a lot of texts here as we work through these lessons, so I hope you have your Bible handy. If by any chance you would like to dig into these lessons a little more, you're more than welcome to get our materials uh, that we use in our discussion here. They're available at our website. You can probably see the address on your screen there. Theox, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, and you will see not only the written materials, but um, the audio and the video, if you choose to look at that. So, before we begin, hope you have your Bible handy, let's say a word of prayer together. Our kind and wonderful Father, we recognize your presence with us here and each Sabbath. We recognize... Uh, the exa incredible example you set us and the way you related to different people from the poorest of the poor to the richest of the rich in your day. It's difficult for us to reach across to people in other social classes, but in following your example, we must learn. Help us to do that as we study these lessons together as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Are there special challenges in dealing with the rich and the famous? Yeah. I've been trying to get in touch with Mr. Bill Gates so I could spread my gospel to him, but <laughs> he's hard to get to. I see. They've got these big walls and motorized gates, and mm -hmm. they're, they're hard to get access to. Would you be afraid to speak to him about the gospel if you got a chance to speak to him? No, I don't. I don't think so. You'd probably have to set the stage pretty well. You just wouldn't want to blast away. <laughs> That's okay. probably why he has the gates. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <clears throat> well, but now look at the Old Testament. Weren't there a lot of rich people in the Old Testament? Famous person? Can you name some? Abraham. Abraham. What about his nephew Lot? Absolutely. What about Job, richest man in the East, right? What about Joseph? Now, he had some ups and downs, but he ended up being pretty wealthy, didn't he? What about David and Solomon? Probably Daniel, just to mention a few, right? Well, but these people didn't need any proselyting. No, but what I'm saying is, God doesn't seem to have any problem working with people who are wealthy. Right? I mean, you know, look at, look at the... Look at the status he gives David. None of those are people who were probably uh, comfortable in their own position, though. They, they were still, they had an inquiring mind. They wanted to learn more and, and take instruction. Well, but in the case of Job specifically, and possibly in the others as well, but it seems to me in the case of Job specifically that he had all of this wealth because God blessed him. I see, and the reason he lost it is because he was such a sinner, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> Job is an unusual circumstance. But. I see. Okay. And when Job proved the test, then, you know. Got God, it all back. God, again. Yeah, they blessed him even more. Why does it seem to be so difficult to reach out to the wealthy and the famous? I think we tend to be overawed by them, mm -hmm. not necessarily. There's a well-known song that says the beggar man and the mighty king are all the same, but only different in name. And when you analyze it, that's about right. <laughs> okay. Well, we're, we're, we consider ourselves um, at a lower socioeconomic status, and we're afraid that they will treat us like we treat those who are of a lower socioeconomic status than ourselves. Oh, dear. That couldn't happen, could it? <laughs> Well, am I, am I it, making it, trouble here? 
Maybe it's because of what it says in Matthew 19, 24, <coughs> Mark and Luke repeat the same story. It is much harder for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Is that the problem? What does that mean? Yeah. Impossible. According to the word. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, then you go back to, to the people in the Old Testament that are rich. How, how does that fit that? And how does that fit with several places in the Old Testament? God saying, if you are... If you follow me, I will bless you and you will be wealthy. Mm -hmm. Well, Elijah seemed to deal with the rich pretty easily. He just marched right into their Ahab's court and he said, there's not going to be any rain until I say so. Bye. And he's gone. He didn't mince any words. Um, well, <laughs> isn't the crux of some of this is there's nothing wrong with being wealthy. It's what you do with it. Yeah. The influence it has. Once again, that was a, a little, well, he'd better get out of town quick, or he's, <laughs> he won't be able to get out of town. Once again, that's a different situation, but okay. we wouldn't, I wouldn't just go up to Warren Buffett and say something like that, or, or anybody. Okay. Unless I had been directed, and I guess that's, wouldn't we assume that Elijah was... Mm -hmm. Is that what I'm supposed to do? Is go up and point my finger and say, you know, it's harder for you to get into heaven than it is for the camel to go through an eye of a needle, and uh, you better shape up, buddy. Yeah. Well, it's okay for Jesus to say that, but not you. Yeah. Or me. Well, well look at Deuteronomy 8. Deuteronomy 8, verses 17 and 18. So then... You must never think, this is Moses speaking to the children of Israel in his, one of his final discourses to them. So then you must never think that you have made yourselves wealthy by your own power and strength. So how do you get, power, how do you get wealth? Remember that it is the Lord, your God, who gives you the power to become rich. He does this because he is still faithful today to the covenant that he made with your ancestors. So then the Pharisees and the Sadducees were right all along. Obviously. Well, you know, being rich back then versus being rich right now, is, it, is there a little difference there? Uh, right what now, kind of differences? Well, like right now, you have to put in all your time to, be, to make money, to become rich. Okay, you don't think um, the rich people did it in those days? Well, I think the issue was different back in those days. Back in those days, might made right... Mm -hmm. It was the people that were the most powerful were the richest ones. You don't they think were, that's true today? Well, they get, they get that power from being rich. But back then, you start out by, with power and then you become wealthy. I see. Type of thing. No, I think there's really a point here mm -hmm. because back with Job and Abraham and all those people, they didn't get their wealth that way. They got their wealth by following the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so they made themselves a good example. So the reason everybody at this table is so wealthy is because we're following the Lord. We're not that wealthy. None <laughs> of us are that wealthy. So that if you means, think we're wealthy, you, you haven't seen wealth. <laughs> so, so that means that we're really in trouble because the reason we don't have that wealth is because we aren't following the Lord. No, I'm just saying today, <laughs> I'm saying today that, that people get their wealth a different way than they did back then. Back then... They used a big club? Yeah, they had a big club. Right here, you, you're clever. You right. work hard, you do all kinds of things, and you leave God out of your... Can, you, of think, your, can um, you think of some people who are very wealthy in Old Testament times who were very scoundrelly, bad people? Did well, Abraham use a big club? That's my point. I'm saying that these people who use big clubs are usually the ones that got wealthy. And when somebody went and did the things the Lord's way and became wealthy, it, they became a spectacle to everybody. Didn't you think that because when they, Abraham wandered all over the countryside, being rich, being rich, and not being a, a king that goes around... Um, pillaging and, he would, he and whatever and, and taking money, you know, as, as toll from people. 
course, he did have his own army, and he did uh, go up against several kings and conquered them. Conquered yeah, them. But, yeah, but that was he didn't go after them premeditatively. They, he went after them because they went after him. Well, and not only that, but when he did um, have uh, the victory over them, he didn't take any of the spoils. That's right. And w uh, look when he buried Sarah. Mm -hmm. They said, you can have the land. You're a rich, powerful person. You can just take it. Go ahead and take it. And he said, no, I want to buy it. Mm -hmm. So th well, they did things differently back then, and it, it impressed people differently than it is now. I'm not, I'm not quite sure if you can compare the rich people with the rich people back then mm -hmm. as far as the relationship to God goes, because the, the issues are different. What about Nebuchadnezzar? He said, look how great Babylon is. I built it as my capital city to display my power and might, my glory and majesty, Daniel 4, verse 30. And what did he spend the next seven years doing? Living like an insane. animal. Yeah. Living like an animal, behaving like an insane person. Did Dan, did, do you think Nebuchadnezzar ever learned his lesson? Yes. Yes. Why do you think that? Daniel 4, the end of Daniel 4. Got restored. Starting with verse 34, Daniel 4. When the seven years had passed, said the king, I looked up at the sky and my sanity returned. I praised the supreme God and gave honor and glory to the one who lives forever. He will rule forever and his kingdom will last for all time. He looks on the people of the earth as nothing. Angels in heaven and people on earth are under his control. No one can oppose his will or question what he does. When my sanity returned, he says it again, my honor and my majesty and the glory of my kingdom were given back to me. My officials and my noblemen welcomed me and I was given back my royal power with even greater honor than before. And now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, honor, and glorify the king of heaven. Everything he does is right and just and he can, humbly, he can humble anyone who acts proudly. Let me be the first example, <laughs> right? So do okay. you think that's you think that sounds like a true change in him? Sounds like it. <clears throat> okay, well let's go to the New Testament since we're mainly talking about Jesus. John three. Who is in John three? Nicodemus. There was a Jewish leader named Nicodemus who belonged to the party of the Pharisees. One night he went to Jesus and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher sent by God. No one could perform the miracles you're doing unless God were with him. And Jesus answered. Yeah, let's have a long theological discussion, right? I don't think so. You don't think so? <laughs> he said, just straight away, he says, cut to the chase. Unless you're born again, you have no chance to see the kingdom of God. So why did Nicodemus even want to see him in the first place? Well, that's a good question. <coughs> Nicodemus, if you read the, the writings of Ellen White where she discusses this, she says Nicodemus was really impressed when Jesus cleansed the temple. He himself felt like that was, of course, remember, he's a Pharisee, and the temple, all that business going on in the temple was controlled by the Sadducees, and he felt really bad about it. He had to walk through that mess every day when he went to the Sanhedrin. Mm -hmm. okay. And so he, when he saw Jesus cleaning things up, he said, now there's somebody who has the power, not only the power, but the courage to do what I should have done. So you think he came to see him to thank him? or do you Well, to, to try to figure out what was going on with this guy. I think he wanted to know more. Okay. But he wasn't necessarily a stand-up guy. He snuck around it to do yeah. it at night time. So what did he do? <clears throat> Sneaks in at night time when no one mm -hmm. would see him. And why did he try to approach Jesus at night time? Because he knew that the majority of the Sanhedrin was vigorously opposed to Jesus and Nicodemus would lose his standing if, if he were known to be associated with Jesus at that time. So did Nicodemus, after talking to Jesus, stand up and say, I support Jesus wherever I go? No. What did he do? in the background. He thought about it and kind of behind the scenes threw up some roadblocks for the Sanhedrin. Okay. I think he made up his mind pretty much. 
he just kept in the background, and I think later on he came came out again. He felt that he could perhaps do more for the Lord's cause, trying to prevent the Sanhedrin from taking action against Jesus. So he asked questions like, do we condemn a man before we've heard him? And the, the Sanhedrin was just, they were ready to, they were ready to send out an arrest warrant for Jesus. And, you know, they sort of had to, hold on, you know, we, we got to obey our own rules. What, what's the final story of Nicodemus? What happened to him? Well, the last that we hear about him is, I think, is uh, he was one of those who <clears throat> publicly um, helped to, to take the body of Jesus down from the cross. Okay, there were three of them. Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, and John the disciple were the ones who took the body down and carried it off and buried it in the tomb. It was Joseph's tomb, and who paid for the spices and the, and, and the claws to wrap up the body of Jesus? Nicodemus. Nicodemus. Ellen White, in the book uh, Desire of Ages, page 177, first two paragraphs, says these words. After the Lord's ascension, when the disciples were scattered by persecution, Nicodemus came boldly to the front. He employed his wealth in sustaining the infant church that the Jews had expected to be blotted out at the death of Jesus. In the time of peril, he who had been so cautious and questioning was firm as a rock, encouraging the faith of the disciples and furnishing means to carry forward the work of the gospel. He was scorned and persecuted by those who had paid him reverence in, in other days. He became poor in this world's goods, yet he faltered not in the faith which had its beginning in that night conference with Jesus. Nicodemus related to John the story of that interview, and by his pen, it of course that's John's pen, it was recorded for the instruction of millions. The truths there taught are as important today as they were on that solemn night, in the shadowy mountain when the Jewish ruler came to learn the way of life from the lowly teacher of Galilee. Zara of Ages 177. Is, that, is any of that directly mentioned in the Bible or is it only Ellen White that says those things? Well, those are quote, those, that quote is from Ellen White. Yeah. Uh, we know that what was mentioned that he... At the he, burial. He, at the burial he was involved. We know that um, he obviously associated with John enough so that John, he told John the story. We know that much from the Bible. Yeah. Now, it seems a little strange to me that he would help so much on the burial when everybody else was running away. Mm -hmm. So, well, how come he didn't say, all? Oh, well, I guess he died. I guess it's over with now and just go back to his business. Well, what did Jesus say to John that maybe it made a difference? To, to Nicodemus. To Nicodemus. Um, not that I can think of anything. As the Moses raised up the snake. snake on the cross in the Old Testament, so the Son of Man is to be lifted up, right? Mm -hmm. That's still a little cryptic, isn't it? A little cryptic, but... The, he told the disciples straight out what was going to happen. Yeah. They didn't believe. How come he believed? Then? Well, ask yourself. Well, Had he well, already wonder. started to change his yeah. paradigm? He, he was a scholar enough, so he, he recognized the implications of what Jesus said. And Nicodemus well, wasn't, uh, I don't think he was a coward. I think, uh, um, I think he, there was just a, a work, a place that he fit in that was, like Gordon says, kind of behind the scenes. And now, um, at the cross, um, there was a work that needed to be done, and um, he did you know, it. He he undertook it. Mm -hmm. He was becoming convinced during the time that Jesus was ministering. It, it didn't sound like Jesus uh, reproved him or anything for coming out in the the mm -hmm. night and being secret about it either. Mm -hmm. He just kind of let him come in his own way. There's another story about another rich man that we should look at. It's found in Luke 19. By the way, it's interesting that it's found in Luke. Uh, what kind of things are found in Luke that aren't found in the other Gospels? 
things about women and children. And? And non-Jews. And non-Jews, especially, or, or people who were despised by the Jews. Look at Luke 19. Jesus went on into Gal Jericho and was passing through. There was a chief tax collector there named Zacchaeus, or Zacchaeus, who was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but he was a little man who could not see Jesus because of the crowd. So he ran ahead of the crowd, climbed into a sycamore tree, which, which hung out over the road, um, to see Jesus, who was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to Zacchaeus, Hurry down, Zacchaeus, because I must stay in your house today. And everybody in the crowd says, That's great. <laughs> right? No. Zacchaeus hurried down and welcomed him with great joy. All the people who saw it started grumbling. This man has gone as a guest of the home of a sinner. Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Listen, sir, I will give half of my belongings to the poor, and if I have cheated anyone, I will pay back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Salvation has come to this house today, for this man also is a descendant of Abraham. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So, this is approximately one week before his crucifixion. Jesus, with a great crowd of people, is passing through Jericho, and they're getting ready to take that uphill climb from Jericho to Jerusalem. Jericho, remember, is almost a thousand feet below sea level. Many of the crowd were excited because they believed that Jesus would become the new king of Israel. Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector in Jericho, had heard the preaching of John the Baptist. And where did John the Baptist do his preaching? The Jordan. A short distance from Jericho, across the Jordan and knew about the preaching and teaching of Jesus. He was excited when he heard that what? Jesus had welcomed a former tax collector to be one of his disciples. And oh, so, Levi. what? Matthew, Levi, Ma yeah. Levi, Matthew. So, so what does Zacchaeus think about all that? Hope for him. Yeah, there's hope for him. So the tax collectors, just to, re just to review, the tax collectors were a very despised group among the Jews. They were not only regarded as traitors because of what? They were working for the Roman government now, right? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, many of them extracted more in taxes than they really needed to, or than they were supposed to according to the law. And what did they do with the extra money? Put it in their pocket. Put it in their pocket. So they were not only traitors, but they were thieving traitors. But Jesus recognized that even these thieving traitors needed salvation. And what do we know about the history of Zacchaeus? Now we have to turn to a little background by Ellen White here. Zacchaeus had already tried to mend his ways and return the money that he had taken unfairly. But of course, who would be opposed to that kind of a behavior? The other tax collectors. The other tax collectors. I mean, if Zacchaeus, as the head of the tax collector, starts saying, well, we've been taking more than we should have, and, uh, and, and I need to return some, and, uh, what does that do to their source of income? It certainly makes them look bad. Yeah. Doesn't make them look better in the eyes of the general public, it does it. So, so, so I wonder if they tried, they tried to all get together and be consistent with their, with their overcharge? Well, you would think so, wouldn't you? Oh, my. I don't want to... <laughs> Even the people he tried to give money back to said, What are you doing? What, what did you do? Right? Are you, are you trying to trap us? Yeah. I'd be thinking he's trying to get some kind of a bribe or something. Yeah. Well, of course, we know what happened. When Zacchaeus heard that Jesus was coming to town, he had to see him. And we know what happened. While the self-righteous Pharisees and priests, many of whom lived in Jericho, there were many, many priests who lived in Jericho, and I'm sure many Pharisees, they sneered and scowled, salvation came to the house of Zacchaeus. And by the way, for those of you who are biblical scholars and geographical scholars, who else, was very, who else lived or worked very close to Jericho? Do you remember? Another whole group of people, famous people. 
Well, certainly Rahab was from Jericho. Oh, that was a long time before, yeah. yes. But even in the days of Jesus, the Essenes, hmm. remember? Hmm. Their place is only a short distance from Jericho. So what are the hazards of being wealthy? People might want what you got. Well, some people have said, you don't really own your things. Your things own you. In some parts of the world, there's such a drive to keep up with the Joneses. Of course, that wouldn't happen here, right? The people, quote, and I, and I quote, spend money they, they don't have for things they don't need in order to impress people they don't like. Now, do any of us know anybody who does that? Certainly no one at this table. No, no, no. <laughs> to the wealthy, money quickly becomes a kind of idol. Someone once said, money isn't everything, but it's way ahead of whatever's in second place. <laughs> I have to chuckle when I think of that. Money represents time and effort. I mean, let's be honest. It represents a part of our lives. I mean, that money that's in the bank or it's in our 401k or it's in, you know, that's a... For those who are in the United States, they know a 401k is a retirement account. It represents our life, you know. It takes a lot of time to accumulate it. Yeah. And how we use it clearly represents what's most important to us. And so we're reminded of verse found in 1 Timothy 6, verse 10. For the love of money is... The root of all evil, or as my Good News Bible says, a source of all kinds of evil. So it Why doesn't is that? say money itself is the root no, of all evil, it's like it's right. often stated. It says the love of money. Mm -hmm. Well, look at a couple of other verses. Look at Mark 4, verses 18 and 19. Other people, are, and this is a parable from Jesus, other people are like seeds sown among the thorn bushes. These are the ones who hear the message, but the worries about this life, the love for riches, and all other kinds of desires crowd in and choke the message, and they don't bear fruit. Do we want to be that kind of people? Well, is it clear to each one of us why the love of money is the root of all evil? Is that, is that an overstatement of the truth? As, as Jesus is exaggerating through Paul, or is it true in our lives? Well, it's, it becomes an idol. I think it's always been. It's true. your, it's your protection. Mm -hmm. It's your source of protection. It's your source of um, shelter, where God probably should be that. Mm -hmm. It can be more than just an idol. It can be our God, mm -hmm. with a small G. If that's what we worship, and that's what our whole life is about. Well, let's turn to another story. This one's found in Mark 10. I'm going to start with verse 13. Some people brought children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples scolded the people. When Jesus noticed this, he was angry and said to his disciples, Let the children come to me and do not stop them, because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I assure you that whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Then he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on each of them, and blessed them. And what happened next? As Jesus was starting on his way again, a man ran up, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to receive eternal life? So what was he hoping to receive? He wanted God, he wanted Jesus to put his hand on his head and bless him just as he blessed the children. And what was Jesus' response? First. Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. What commandments is he talking about? Ten commandments. Ten commandments. Do not accuse anyone falsely. Do not cheat. Respect your father and your mother. But he doesn't list them all. Teacher, the man said, ever since I was young, I have obeyed all these commandments. Did he be really believe that he had fully kept all the commandments? Absolutely. He did. Jesus looked straight. By the way, can you think of another person who might have been in that same category? 
in his younger days? Paul. Probably Paul. If Paul had been there, he probably would have said exactly what this young man did. Well, in a way, though, he physically did not do those things. Don't you think? You mean Paul? No, I mean the, the rich young ruler there. The rich young oh, yeah. Out, outwardly, he, he obeyed the commandments, probably. Outwardly. Mm -hmm. he didn't, uh, um, Jesus didn't mention the first commandment. He didn't, miss he did any, he didn't but, mention any of the first four. But when he um, told him to go sell everything, he was talking about the first commandment because if you love God before money, you will, you will get rid of your money. Okay. What did Jesus tell the young man? Uh, before, before, you, before we talk about that, let me, let me look at this, this <coughs> comment. Ellen White comments about this young man. Jesus saw in this ruler just the help he needed if the young man would be co-laborer with him in the work of salvation. Think of that. This is Ellen White. Is it so this guy could have been like Paul? Yeah. Well, or John or he Peter. He could see that with everybody, couldn't he? Well, he could apparently... He would see everybody be a, yeah. a, a help to him. If they'd but not everybody is capable of being a Paul. Well, that's true. If this young man would place himself under Christ's guidance, he would be a power for good. In a marked degree, the ruler could have represented Christ. For he possessed qualifications, which, if he were united with the Savior, would enable him to become a divine force, a divine force among men. Christ, seeing into his character, loved him. Love for Christ was awakening in the ruler's heart. For love begets love. Jesus longed to see him, um, a co-worker with himself. He longed to make him like himself, a mirror in which the likeness of God would be reflected. He longed to develop the excellence of his character and sanctify it to the master's use. If the ruler had then given himself to Christ, he would have grown into the atmosphere of his presence, grown in the atmosphere of his presence. If he had made this choice, how different would have been his future? Desire of Ages 519, paragraph 3. So did Jesus want this guy? Was he said, just, you know, get lost, don't, don't bother me? Or did he really want this guy to be a disciple? Why didn't he blind him on the road to Damascus? He just about did. He said, sell everything you have and give <laughs> it to the poor. That, what's more blinding than that? Yeah. Don't Actual think, blinding, huh? Yes. Don't you think Judas was really excited to see this rich young man come to Jesus? Possibly. I think he must have been, wow, you know, here's our chance. <laughs> what do you think the other disciples thought? Probably the same thing. Yeah. But he had to make it here's, somebody, well, here's somebody important. We, we, we could be nice to have somebody important on and our rich. side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and not just a tax collector like Matthew. Mm. Yeah, this would have been somebody like having a CEO come over and run your church. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, somebody that would had some substance to help organize and carry was, on. Was this the first rich person that Jesus had dealt with? No. Who else have we already talked about? Nicodemus. Nicodemus. Do you know any other rich people? that associated with Jesus? Well, really? We did mention Joseph of Arimathea. He was... Yeah, well, but that's later. That's the not... The women that supported him. Yeah. Well, what about Luke 8? It's, 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 Carrie says, sometime later, this is before we get to Luke... Way before we get to Luke 19 here. Sometime later, Jesus traveled to towns and villages preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. The 12 disciples went with him. We know about that. And so did some women who had been healed of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had been driven out. Joanna, whose husband Chusa was an officer. In fact, not just an officer, he was in charge of Herod's possessions. He was the one who ran Herod's business. And Susanna and many other women, many other women, who used their own resources, were these poor women? 
They use their own resources to help Jesus and his disciples. I'm really looking forward to hear about these these people when we get to Kevin. I'm sure there's lots of interesting stories we don't know anything about. Well, Jesus recognized that this young man had a plague spot in his character. His wealth was his idol. So Jesus outlined a three-step process that the young man needed to follow. One, sell everything you have. Two, furnish the poverty-stricken with the means. And three, he needed to follow Jesus. Simple plan, right? A crucifying plan, right? Jesus hadn't asked Nicodemus to do that. He hadn't asked his disciples to do that. He hadn't asked the women who were following him to do that, the wealthy women following him to do that. Why did he ask this guy to do that? Because he asked what he needed to do. Nobody else did. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I think, I, hope that I think it's because the love of money was truly central to this man. Yeah. Well, he's, he said that he kept all the commandments, but he didn't really. Mm -hmm. The first one he didn't keep, mm -hmm. and, it, and it showed. And I think, I think the whole thing was more for his disciples to see than anything. Well, but now let, let's, let's think about this for a moment. We've talked about before the idea that in Jewish thinking, the good people were what kind of people? <coughs> the rich. And healthy. And healthy. Okay? So if you sell all your goods and you become a poor person, what are people going to think about you? You must be wicked. You must be wicked. So Jesus is saying to this guy, what? Turn from a good person into a wicked person and then I'll help you. That, well, doesn't that seem to me more as what he's saying? Well, In their way I of thinking? I wonder about that. I wonder about that because he called him a good good um, sure. rabbi. What was it? Good good rabbi? Why do you call me good? Why do you call me good? Good master. But Jesus yeah. was, didn't have any money. He was poorer than a... He was well, dirt but, poor. But Yeah, but... but so how could he be poor? How could, how could he be good if he's so poor? Well, Jesus, I mean, the young man realized after he watched Jesus for a while, he knew that Jesus had some kind of power that he didn't have. Yeah, but he was then called why rabbi. Would, yeah, but then why would he um, reject that because he would he, sell in everything because he wouldn't be looked at as he, good he anymore? Couldn't, he couldn't be a rabbi. He couldn't see beyond the money to see that Christ... Yeah didn't say he would never give him money again. Is he here to become like Jesus or this is just another another kind of commodity to him? What do you think? He's used to <clears throat> so He's this, used to getting things. Well, and he's so, used to doing things to earn his way to heaven. <clears throat> I've done this and this and this and this and he's hoping Jesus is going to give him a couple more things that he has to do. Yeah, I'll go and do them. Just and that's one gonna, thing. What and, one thing must I do to be saved? Yeah, even one thing. And he wanted, he wanted Jesus' seal of approval. Tell me the one more thing I need to do. And I know everything get, else. Guarantee me, a, guarantee me a place in the one, kingdom. There's got to be one other thing here. What, what, what is it? And I'll, yeah. But he smacks a little bit of being, uh, uh, I was conceited, now I'm perfect. He had, <laughs> Christ knew he had to make a choice. Yeah. A hypocrite, huh? But, you know, it does say the young man went away sorrowing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... It didn't turn him around. You know, there must have been more than just... But do we know any more uh, about this? No. Man, we don't know that he didn't... I mean, we, presumably we would have heard something about him. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, this man's young man's love of self, represented by his love of money, was more powerful to him than his attraction to Jesus and to the gospel. The Tenth Commandment might have been a real impediment to him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You think so? Yeah. Well, it appears to be the... Well, and Ellen White comments again, how many have come to Christ ready to cast their interest in with him, his, and like the rich young ruler, earnestly desiring to inherit eternal life. But when the cost is presented to them, when they are told that they must forsake all, houses and lands, wife and children, and count not their lives dear unto themselves, 
they go away sorrowful. They want the treasures of heaven and the life that measures with the life of God, but they're not willing to give up their earthly treasures. They're not willing to surrender all to obtain the crown of life. Review and Herald, April 19, 1898, paragraph 14. Going on, Christ made the only terms which could place a ruler where he would perfect a Christian character. His words were words of wisdom, though they appeared severe and exacting. And accepting and obeying them was the ruler's only hope of salvation. And we've hinted at that. Why was that his only hope of salvation? Why couldn't he just be saved the way he was? Because he had a God besides... Uh, he god had another heaven. god that he worshipped and he wasn't willing to give up that other god yeah and accepting and obeying them was the ruler's only hope of salvation his exalted position and his possessions were exerting a subtle influence for evil upon his character if cherished they would supplant god in his affections to keep back little or much from god was to retain that which would lessen his moral strength and efficiency for if the things of this world are cherished, however uncertain and unworthy they may be, they will become all absorbing. Desire of Ages 520, paragraph 2. So, do I dare ask if that happens to anybody in our day? Yeah. Do we ever pick the nice things of this world to say, I mean, do... So the, what the, the young man didn't, he wanted to be saved. He wanted the benefits of what Christ had to offer. Didn't he want them? Yeah, he wanted them. But he also wanted to keep what he had, right? What was it that he saw that he didn't have? I mean, there must have been something that attracted him to come to yeah. Jesus. And what, what is it he saw there in Jesus and these funky little disciples and mm -hmm. these crummy little tax collectors that <laughs> that um, he felt he needed to come and ask for one more thing. Good question. Well, uh, clearly Jesus had the power to, to heal people. His disciples had the power to heal people. I don't know whether the rich young ruler had seen that happen. We know that that was possible. He didn't specifically ask for that power, as far as we know. But he saw that Jesus obviously was different. We don't know whether he was a Jew. We don't know whether he had any education. But he'd obviously been thinking this over. He wouldn't ask about eternal life. Yeah. Well, was he puzzled? And you come asking for something, and then when Jesus, I mean, it was just, just another Ferrari for him. <clears throat> and then when Jesus said, well, now you've got to give everything away. Of course, it doesn't say he went away puzzling. He said he went away sorrowing. Maybe mm -hmm. he was bored, but not that bored. Well, as an Adventist, as Advent, the Adventist church, we have tended to be quite successful in evangelizing the poor, the needy, and the social outcasts. I heard one Adventist scholar who was doing an, trying to analyze what was going on in the church say, we bring people in through the basement fireplace and we send them out through the chimney. What did he mean by that? We have this fantastic educational system. We bring in the poor, the uneducated. We give them an education, work through some of the best schools in the country all the way to the top and so forth. And then when they, when they reach that level, a lot of them think they don't need the church anymore and they depart. So why well, have... What do we have to offer uh, the rich and famous? Well, what do we have to offer the rich and famous? <clears throat> well, like the rich young ruler, eternal life if they play it, right? Yeah. Who, who wants to come down and, and mix with a bunch of tax collectors and... So would we say to the rich and the famous, well, keep all your wealth, but we want to add one more thing, just like the rich young ruler asked for? No, we want to say, give us some of that money so we can. 
Yeah, so give, we, give so the money to the poor, and the, uh, our church is right down here. And just dump it in there. Yeah, exactly. Well, and it's a, you know, we're not asking them to become Christians. We're asking them to become Adventists, and that's a whole different thing. Mm -hmm. I got a, this outcast group that everybody thinks they're cults and <clears throat> nothing mixes with their life. Now they got to start going to church on Saturday and. <clears throat> and uh, that's the day that they, I don't know, they go boating or mm -hmm. or that they, if they have to mow their own yard, they mow their own yard. And now they, yeah, that throws their whole scheme of things off. The, the worst part about Adventists isn't they worship, I mean, let's be honest, the worst part about Adventists isn't that they worship on, I mean, the really faithful ones, isn't so much that they worship on Saturday instead of Sunday. The, the difference is that we, we expect you to start on Friday night and spend a whole 24 hours. If you're a regular Christian, most of our friends, I mean, you go to church in the morning, you watch the football game in the afternoon, and you mow your yard if you need to after that. And these people don't need our in through the fireplace and out through the chimney. They've already got all of that. They can, mm -hmm. they've got the connections. They can, it's easy for them to get into Harvard and Yale and belong to the Skull and Bones Club and all of that stuff. So, why do you think we've had relatively poor success at reaching out to the wealthy and the famous? They're too comfortable. It's pretty tough to communicate if they're comfortable in their position, health-wise, economic-wise. Mm -hmm. It's a great impediment. Many of the Pharisees and the they, Sadducees they, did Jesus. They move in a particular world I'm assuming, I haven't been there, but they move in a particular world. <laughs> Maybe that's and, the problem, you're not there. And, and in, order to, uh, in order to function as they function and to continue being rich and famous, if they get out of that world, then um, it's, you know, it, it's, it's the, what their world is. Right. It's very interesting to notice <clears throat> in Acts 15, that when they called the first general conference of the Christian church, you come down to Acts 15, verse 5, it says, but some of the believers, so are these church members, they're part of the general conference, right? Who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. So they haven't left their pharisaical <laughs> ideas completely by any means, but... They, they were impressed enough, so they, they threw in their lot with the Christians. This implies that the Pharisees, as we were discussing, some of these 6,000 became Christians. Mm -hmm. So maybe the whole the thing, there is a cross-section of everybody being converted, but since there's not that many rich people, it looks like there's not that many rich people. Because there, there are a lot of fabulously rich people that have turned Adventists. Mm -hmm. So, and I can tell you a bunch of people who are not rich, you, they still have the same problem of, of trying to come into the church. Of course, you know what we're talking about here is these people becoming Adventist. Yeah. You know, what, what, what's so... What's so hot about that? Why? It, well, know, I can tell you that I can tell you that I know kings and presidents who have wanted to come to Adventist institutions for their health care. Well, I, I I don't have time to tell the whole story right now, but it's very interesting that once upon a time in South Africa. The, King, the, the Kimberly Diamond Mines used to belong, that, that property originally belonged to a, Seventh -day, a person who became a Seventh-day Adventist. Imagine what would happen if that, all that money came into the church. Would uh, ruin the church. Adventists don't do that. There wouldn't be any money because we wouldn't, we wouldn't be digging those diamonds out. We don't wear those <laughs> kinds of things. But, 
we can put them in our watches. <laughs> maybe the, in our watches. or maybe we would. Maybe we would be like those Jews and the pigs. You know, they, we'd, we'd hire somebody else to dig the diamonds out and make. But you know, maybe maybe we're, maybe we're focused on becoming Adventist, whatever that is, and that's the wrong focus. Maybe maybe there's a body of knowledge, a mm -hmm. a a. Um, uh, uh, an awareness about God that that changes your life, and maybe maybe that's not our message. Maybe we want everybody to become like us, whatever lo us is, rather than to become like Jesus. Yeah, join yeah. the franchise. Is that well, making some sense? <laughs> let, let me read to you from Ministry of Healing. Much is said concerning our duty to the neglected poor. Should not some attention be given to the neglected rich? Many look upon this class as hopeless, and they do little to open the, eye, the eyes of those who, blinded and dazed by the glitter of earthly glory, have lost eternity out of their reckoning. Thousands of wealthy men have gone to their graves unwarned, but indifferent as they may appear, many among the rich are soul-burdened. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. He that says to find gold, thou art my confidence, has denied the God that is above. None of them can be by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceases forever. Now that's, of course, King James language for Ecclesiastes 5.10, Job 31, 24, and 28, and Psalm 49, 7, and 8. Riches and worldly honor cannot satisfy the soul. Many among the rich are longing for some divine assurance, some spiritual hope. Many long for something that will bring to an end the monotony of their aimless lives. I mean, why do we see movie stars and rich people committing suicide? So many of them. Many in official life feel their need of something which they have not. Few among them go to church, for they feel they, have re they receive little benefit. The teaching they hear does not touch the heart. Shall we make no personal appeal to them? Ministry of Healing, page 210, paragraphs 1 and 2. So, so we, you know, we'll use Gates again. Uh, okay. It was mentioned earlier, and, you know, they are on the verge, theoretically, of uh, eradicating polio. At mm -hmm. least that's what we're told. They're working on malaria, and they're working right. on HIV. Right. And, Amazing. Uh, and um, so now it would be easy to assume after we've just read this that, you know, well, they really don't have an inner satisfaction in their soul. But on the other side, they may very well be. So what, what am I supposed to do? How, you, you don't what, 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 do I, what do I need to go and preach to these people for if they're... You, you don't have to go to Bill Gates. There are other people around you can work on. Well... <laughs> <laughs> But I, I guess what I'm saying is what, you know, what... But Jay, you're assuming that Bill Gates doesn't have any yes, some of those Christian do. experience. No, I'm, I'm assuming that he does. So why does he need me? So why are you going to... Right, yeah, why do, I, why do I need to go and proselyte the rich and well, famous? Well, okay, let me give you a possibility. There's considerable evidence that wealthy believers played a very important role in sustaining the early Christian church. Some of them, like Nicodemus, became poor as they supported the work of the church. Will there be men and women who do that during the latter reign, just as some did during the early reign? So we've got these very good people who we need to proselyte because the church needs their money. Well, those of us who live, now let's, let's talk about this. Wealth is a relative matter. Those of us who live in the wealthier countries of Europe, Japan, North America, Australia, New Zealand, just to pick a few, and who have not had the privilege of living in, living in wor or working in one of the more underdeveloped countries, may not realize that people in those societies consider all of us to be wealthy. So wealth is a relative term. I can tell you, I worked for 17 years in Africa, and they, they took one look at me, and they said, there was, there's no question in their mind that I was wealthy. So what approach should we take to the wealthy and famous in our day? 
It may not be possible for us to invite ourselves to their homes as Jesus did in the case of Zacchaeus. A little difficult to walk up to Bill Gates' place and say, I'm coming to your house today. And it may be difficult for us even to have an opportunity to speak to them. Is this one reason why we have our health message and our health ministry? Possibly. If we're doing our best to reach everyone around us, do we think God will bring us into contact with the people that we could influence? If we are saying the right thing about God, will he make the possibilities come to us? When we pay a faithful tithe to the church, shouldn't that be an indication that we will spend the rest of our money carefully and promoting God's work as far as possible? Why is money such a taboo subject to talk about? Do we know the financial and economic status of the members of our Sabbath school class? Or, other, or maybe of our church? I can just tell you, well, I had a very, we had a very interesting experience. Um, when I was working in Africa, I applied to come home and, and take a master's degree uh, in public health at Johns Hopkins University. My wife and I were quite amazed that the, the university offered us a com offered me a complete scholarship. It didn't cost me one penny to attend Johns Hopkins University. I was very thankful for that. We had two small children, and we sat down and we calculated, and we figured out if we could stay within a certain budget, we could live for nine months while I was taking that course without either one of us working. And we did that. We had saved up a little bit of money. It wasn't that much. We lived very, very economically during that time. And near the end of that time, I mentioned in Sabbath school class one day to the church members, they just assumed I was a doctor and I was attending Johns Hopkins University, I must be wealthy. We mentioned, I mentioned one time in a class one day that you know, neither one of us was working, and we'd been like this for a number of months. And the, the church just about went into apo <laughs> apoplectic. They started bringing us eggs to church and fruit and stuff like this. Well, in what ways can we also reach out to those who are wealthy and famous? Isn't it time for those of us in the Seventh-day Adventist Church to develop new ways to reach out to them? We need to be thinking outside the box. We need to, and a lot of the problem, I'm sure, is just our reluctance to witness to anybody. How ready are we to speak the truth to even the poor guy on the corner? We need to do better. And maybe you do too. See you next week.